Good morning, everybody. I saw most of you, almost everyone, yesterday. Or no need to present myself. Uh, what I intend to do this morning <coughs> is to um, go through. <laughs> if I move too much, you'll get a problem. I just say it. Yeah. Okay. Um, to discuss fit in the line of what I said yesterday, uh, what I call the invention of European human rights. Um, I'm not a specialist in human rights, so I say that right from the start. Uh, but I am somehow involved in a project, a project at the University of Leuven about human rights. Uh, and as I'm one of the only historians who's part of that network, they asked me to develop a little bit about the history of human rights. And then, of course, people think, oh, they are going to have a very <coughs> history of <coughs> say, Adam and Eve, origin of human rights somewhere, usually in antiquity. Uh, but if you heard my talk yesterday, it's not the way I proceed, and that's usually not the way historians proceed anyway. Um, I called my, the time, the, gave my, my, my lecture the title The Invention of European Human Rights. Uh, that concept of invention, like the title of my book that I presented with more or less history, Imagining, that may be a little bit surprising for non historians. Historians are very familiar with it. They know what it means, but non-historians, they always, they feel always a little bit puzzled. Um, what do I mean by invention? I certainly do not uh, refer to something that is imagined out of the blue. That is not there. It just produce of your imagination. No, that is not what we mean with the term invention or like like scientists invent something, uh, or imagining, no, that is not what we mean. What we mean is that some elementary things of our history are redefined, reconstructed at different times. And in fact, the best way to, to illustrate what it actually means is to go to uh, Oops, who introduced it and the concept. And the invention, the invention, one of the first major titles that used that concept is this volume by Eric Hobsbawm and Paris Terence Range of Invention of Judicial. I just wonder, apart from <laughs> one person, uh, who has read that book or knows about the book? Yeah. A few people, yeah but only professors, I see. Um, but perhaps, uh, what does it, what do you, do you recall from it? What, what does it mean? What, what do, why this book is, is it in? I think that the international tradition is a very important book, yeah. especially for those who are studying the national identity, because it shows that national identity is not so spontaneous as people usually see, but exactly. it's a creation of elite. Yeah. And uh, also has uh, ingenious examples how, for instance, uh, in the age of the French Revolution, the tradition was invented, but we know from experience in Hungary that uh, every regime which we have uh, invents a new history. Exactly. Yeah. So it's in that sense that I use the term invention. Uh, imagine is very similar. Invention of tradition is also important in a, I would say, in a more profound way. Because in social science thinking, there is a tendency, it's much more than a tendency, to uh, separate time between the modern time and the pre-modern time. And modern time uh, is the time of rationality, when we get rid of tradition. Uh, pre-modern times, behavior, was determined by the traditions. Modern time, we become individual, rational being, human beings. Clearly, even though unintended, Hobbes, Palm, and Rangers are one of the 
first to really put it in grander narrative, undermine that thinking. Because if traditions are typically part of nationalism, you find uh, traditions are reinvented again and again, also in the 19th and 20th century, this whole distinction between modernity and pre-modernity loses a lot of its meaning. Right. Uh, one of the first books who uses the concept of inventing, okay. I may not touch this, <laughs> something <laughs> happens, <laughs> inventing human rights uh, is Lin Hunt. I will now and then refer to uh, the book of Lin Hunt, who argues that human rights is, is perhaps the most classic example. Human rights uh, developed mainly in the 18th century. And she refers to the Grand Revolution, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. However, she does in a different way as usual by referring to the emotional elements of uh, the discovery or invention of human rights. She doesn't go into uh, discussions about the role of enlightenment, uh, that uh, the discovery of human rights is the result of some kind of revolution in intellectual thinking. No, it is an emotional thing. It is because people started to read about uh, lives of others, about the world, that they became interested. They felt connected with others. It's that emotional binding that, for her, lays at the origin of human rights. So, in one way, it's a very traditional book because it refers to the grand revolutions. But on the other hand, it develops a very different approach. And that makes it novel. <clears throat> what I will do now is as I said, a more historiographical overview, how our thinking about human rights has been revolutionized in more or less a decade. The debate today among historians and also legal scientists is completely, has completely changed. So I will say a few things about this historiographical revisionism. And secondly, I will develop the idea of human, European human rights. And I know I still didn't explain what I mean by European human rights. You have to wait for that. Right. A revisionist history. There are many ways to revision uh, the traditional narratives. First of all, we have to recall these narratives. I'm not going to speak in much detail. First of all, they are Eurocentric. They locate the origin and history of human rights in the European tradition. There's no uh, consideration for non-European traditions. Uh, those of you who read the article, who did read the article in advance, by the way? I sent around an article. No, but, <laughs> but I was already deep. Um, well, if you look at the standard, also very recent textbooks about history of human rights, there is hardly anything, perhaps in the introduction, uh, about non-European uh, contributions to human rights. Paradoxically, if you look at Wikipedia, you will find more information. It says how Wikipedia somehow captures uh, intellectual discussions more than the academia. Even if the what is what you find is perhaps not so adequate, but nevertheless it's not too bad. At least the English pages. What we see in traditional narratives is more or less a linear story, even with some variations. There is the so-called Hegelian uh, variation with the uh, you know the traditional way of a logic, um, thesis and that thesis, synthesis and so forth. The whole idea is there is a kind of dynamic history and the result is human rights. 
The key periods are always the American and French Revolution, and then we jump to the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights, about which I would speak, of course, much more. Uh, it's already a bit strange because human rights, progress, and so forth are associated with <coughs> modern time very often. Right? Human rights in the traditional narrative are a bit the pinnacle of progress, of social progress. But then it is very strange because the key periods are the American and French revolutions and then the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War. So what happened in the meantime? What happened in the meantime? The period that we call modernity. Lynn Hunt asked the question. The last chapter in her book is, and actually uh, one, it only has eight chapters or something like that, why human rights failed only to succeed in the long term. And then, of course, it's the usual suspects. Conservatism, nationalism, racism, communism, and so forth and so forth. The dividing line is the, particularly the Second World War. In 2012, Samuel Moyne, then at the University of Columbia, New York, published his book, The Last Utopia. The Last Utopia is really, it was kind of bombshell. It's a bomb in, in the, both in legal scholarship and, and in history. Because it really revolutionized the narratives about human rights. First of all, he discusses the idea, also, by the way, that the Enlightenment period, the period of the Great Revolutions also, is the, constitutes the origin, the basis of human rights. He says that's not the case. Yes, you have the word appears, but what is understood by human rights is something entirely different. It's a totally different reality. The main element, that it's a brilliant insight, is that for more human rights, as they, had, where they, as they developed in the 18th and 19th century, were constituent of the state. So they became part of the development of sovereignty, of citizenship, but were also locked into that citizenship. They were not universal. Human rights, for going our definition, or the way we understand human rights today, is human rights are universal. They apply for everybody. More than I use very strongly, that was not the case with particularly the French Revolution. What Moyen further argues by analyzing the way uh, human rights are defined and understood today is that they are defined as individual rights. They belong to the individual. And they are framed as rights against the state. See already people thinking. Uh, that's a key element of his thinking, we return to criticism later. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, he says that's quite an interesting document, where you already see that human rights are viewed as individuals, as individual, but it's largely a stillborn document. It had hardly any effect. It had hardly any effect. One of the reasons was, that it became part of uh, the Cold War struggle, partly because also uh, it became uh, framed within, uh, or became limited in the discussions of decolonization. I'll return to that element in a minute. A further element that he emphasized is, well, human rights, as they were developed after the Second World War, 
major source of inspiration was Christianity. Oh, this very for some people who would say, well, that's nothing, not, not so surprising. Actually, within the larger literature, it's absolutely surprising. It's even quite revolutionary. Because human rights were, for example, also in the book of Vinland and all the traditional histories before, associated with the idea of progress and with modernity and absolutely not with Christianity, which is per definition uh, in, in, in that kind of narratives, not part of progress and so forth. What Moin argues is this kind of secularist way of reading modern history is fundamentally wrong. You hear the echo of what I said uh, yesterday. The Christian inspiration was actually very important, particularly he refers to personalism and the whole idea of freedom of religion. Refer mainly to authors of just such as Jacques Martin. All these elements are revolutionary. The really revolutionary meaning is still right. Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann, I forgot for where he is originally, he's, he's a German, but he ended up at the University of California, Berkeley, um, criticized Moyne, but continued in his thought. He said actually, Moyne argues that. Uh, the next major argument of Moyne is human rights become only important in the, politically, at the level of international politics in particular, in the 1970s. And he, in, the, in the very beginning of his book, he argues they emerged somewhere seemingly from nowhere. Moyne is a provocative art, author, and he really says that to provoke his readers clearly. Uh, on well, what is his argument based? His argument is based on the emergence of NGOs like Amnesty International. It is based on an analysis of international politics and it's human rights. They become indeed an element of international politics only in the 1970s. For example, in, for example sorry, with the Helsinki Accords Think agreements with Jimmy Carter in 1977 puts human rights as at the center of American uh, international policy, in part as a belated answer to redeem uh, the United States after the debacle of Vietnam. But it's really that that plays here a major role, but also what he calls the crisis of utopias. Um, the belief in communism is, disappears in Eastern Europe. In Latin America you have all these dictatorships. You have indeed Vietnam and so forth. So in that sense, human rights appear as the last utopia, just as actually Moyne has argued. So the last utopia, that was the title of the book of, that is the title of the book of Moyne, it is the narrative after, what's that? After uh, the great ideologies like capitalism, uh, communism have lost their significance. That's the argument of Moyne, Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann, he argues a little bit with Moyne, but doesn't really change that much, only he emphasizes that the real impact of human rights discourse on international politics actually dates from late, from the 1990s. Then you have a, what he calls an ethical turn not only in international politics, but also in philosophy, in uh, political thinking, and so forth. 
and he emphasizes that again, it's not so typical for historians, I think, this whole change, this ethical, uh, ethical turn is the result of the major international changes, of the major changes in the international crime. It's not a cause. Human rights are not a cause of the fall of the wall, for example. The end of the Cold War. No, it's opposite. It is because, and actually an argument that also Moyen, although more implicitly, uses, is that uh, you have the end of ideologies, and then in uh, the end of the day is the fall of, of the wall, the Iron Curtain, that opens up the space, that opens up space <coughs> in which human rights can move to the forefront, can be used in international discussion, can be advanced by the United States, also by Europe, as a major element of international politics. What neither of them really argue, what I argue is that it's, I follow the orders, these orders to some extent, but that is part of a process of redemption for the United States after the Vietnam War, after also their involvement in Latin America, uh, dictatorship and so forth, and for Europe after the colonization. I referred to that a little bit yesterday and I returned to that in a later, uh, later in, in, in my talk. It is in this context that the Holocaust becomes a um, uh, major reference from the idea of no more genocide with the Rwandan uh, genocide in 1994 and also the Kosovo War from uh, 1998, 1999, which was viewed at the time, and that's why I give this nice quotation from, of uh, Vaclav Havel as the proof that finally human rights were a driving force behind international politics. If it's true or not, I don't express myself. I'm just saying that already expresses or indicates that I'm quite skeptical about this. But nevertheless, it's a discourse that becomes quite important. And the highlight, if I may say, is the creation of the International Criminal Court in 2002. Some elements of critique, there are quite a lot you can express. By the way, you have questions. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Fair to ask. Okay. Right. Elements of critique. Uh, many you can express, but I do think it's important to, to return to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Moyn and also Hoffman rather um, dismiss as not so as still born without effect. I think that is highly problematic. Well, let's look at the text itself. Um, all human beings are free and equal, dignity and rights. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms without distinction of any kind, race, color, sex, language, religion, <coughs> political or other uh, opinion, national, social origin, property, birth, and so forth and so forth. Right? Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political, jurisdiction, judicial, or international status of the country. What do, why, what is, why this uh, little bit strange uh, formulation? What is actually meant? I look at the students in particular. Maybe because <clears throat> there are some entities, uh, countries which are not recognized and uh, which are some nations which are struggling for their uh, own countries. That's why. 
That's a very elaborate description, almost more elaborate than this one, for colonies. We are, 1948, still a big part of the world, we're colonies. Right. Hoffman criticizes Moyn on another point, although he doesn't refer to this too much, uh, that there is a major human right that is completely missing in this kind of narratives, and that is self-determination. Self-determination for Hoffman is, the more, is in fact the underlying uh, logic of human rights. Oh. And indeed you see uh, that self-determination is referred to in a number of documents. Mm -hmm. What is the big problem with self-determination? Mm. The big problem is that self-determination as it is understood in the 1940s, 50s, and largely also today, is understood as a collective right. While for Moin, human rights are by definition individual. Mm -hmm. Right? Self-determination uh, in the European Union, in the Treaty of the European Union, in the first articles, it's mentioned as uh, like freedom of expression alongside of these things and it's emphasized uh, your individualities but in this case as I understood when I read this uh, article first and it's always emphasized treaty in the European Union. Uh, I'll return to that. Okay. Keep that in mind mm -hmm. because we will return to the to, to uh, the European Convention. But you refer now mainly to present day documents, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. And that is, it's very important that you mention today, self-determination is again also redefined as an individual right. Mm -hmm. Now, actually if you look at the genealogy of the word self-determination in the 18th century, it was used as individual. It has become a collective right in the course of the 19th century, very closely connected with the development of nationalism. It's a fascinating story. If you want to read more about it, there are two great articles by the Alec Wrights in the American Historical Review a couple of years ago, um, I think 2013 or something, uh, for the genealogy of the concept of self-determination uh, a couple of years earlier, wonderful, wonderful article explaining the importance of the idea of self-determination in European and world, and, and world history. I will return to it a little bit, but this is an important element. Self-determination Absolutely, for one, no part of his story. More in general, social and economic rights, more in completely doesn't mention social or economic rights. It's clear, in my view, I have the impression, more is continuing a Cold War discussion by focusing exclusively on individual rights in and really emphasizing takes on board a kind of, it's a very American, almost Cold War perspective on the issue of human rights. But we do see that in the post period also social and economic rights are important. They are advanced by uh, communist countries, but also by others. For example, Scandinavian countries. It's often, you find in the literature, about well, that is associated with, with communist countries. It's not true. And there are major documents in the post-war period that engage with uh, social and economic rights. For example, the ILO Declaration of Philadelphia 44, uh, the International Covenant on Economic Social Rights in 1966. So there are quite a number of documents referring to social and economic rights, but they are somehow dissociated. 
So you have narratives of human rights, what Moyn is focusing on, and you have very different, this rough, all these social and economic rights, which effectively are developed as much as a human rights. Uh, another issue is the relationship between human rights and decolonization. Very important element as well. Um, Moyn completely dismisses the relationship, and especially argues that human rights were not used in decolonization by anti-colonial, anti-imperialist <coughs> militants. There is a lot of research now, already at that moment, by people like Roland Berg and Fabian Klose, uh, who argue that first human rights were used by anti-colonial militants in Africa and Asia. Secondly, it also functioned within European countries and also in America, but particularly in European countries, who are by people who oppose colonialism. And there is actually a very complex reality about human rights and colonization. There's a whole discussion uh, on this element and clearly it is linked also to discussions around uh, self-determination. Let's move to Europe. Finally, human rights are essential to the way European countries, and particularly the EU, they are not the same, of course, but I will more or less equalize them for the moment. Uh, very essential to the way the EU defines itself and also is viewed by others. Take the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2012. Well, human rights actually were also part of the motivation to give the, the Nobel Prize to the EU. And look at it, it's part of the, of the official press statement. The Union and its foreigners have Blah, 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 blah. Contributed the defense of peace, reconciliation. Democracy and human rights in Europe. often refers to the European Convention of Human Rights as the founding document of uh, this narrative of human rights. It was signed as the Palazzo Barberi in Rome for November 1950. According to one of the people who was present, Paul van is part of the he said it's a wonderful palace, but an awful document illustrating that there were already people who saw that there is a problem with that document. But it is, in many ways, in a number of ways, and that's always emphasized, a revolutionary document. It goes much further, in some ways, as a universal declaration. It includes a commission, it foresees a commission of human rights to monitor the situation of human rights in the countries who subscribe to the convention. Secondly, it foresees a court of justice with adequate sanctions. Now, two things that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights didn't foresee. That was one declaration. Here we see the desire to go one step further, to have a real binding document with instruments to follow up and to implement. That's the traditional narrative. And yes, it's justified. That's right. However, there are a number of problems with it. So here, yeah, the Commission, the 
European Count of Human Rights in the right of petition. So individuals can uh, petition and uh, make a complaint. And uh, this respect for freedoms and human rights are conditions of membership also for the Council of Europe. Right? This is the European Convention of Human Rights was signed within the framework of the Council of Europe. And that becomes also more or less the only uh, competence of the Council of Europe. However, there is one major difference, which is not always well understood, that it is not recognized the universality of human rights. It is all, it starts very innocent. <coughs> it is uh, it applicable to everyone within their jurisdiction. And it refers to the European countries. But then the so called colonial clauses refer basically that they did not apply to the colonies, the mandates. And so only if the country subscribing explicitly recognizes that they are also applicable to the colonies or mandates, then they will be extended. There was original discussion, would it include all the colonies and mandates? That was not upheld. There are also from other strange things. Uh, that it actually uh, the human rights as declared in the uh, convention can be uh, suspended in times of war. Which is rather bizarre because the tendency is rather the opposite. And the human rights develop first in form as protections during war and so forth. And then so suddenly here, not in, in war or conflict, they are not um, applicable. They did not refer to self determination, also not uh, social rights and so forth. We can wonder, as was expressed at the time, for example, by Leopold Senghor, who was then a political representative of one of the colonies, the French colonies. <coughs> Uh, and later president of Senegal. So, are they European rights? Are they human rights at all? If you follow the definition of Senegal Moyne, they're not. They're simply not. Okay, how can you explain the differences between the Universal Declaration and the European Convention? Now recently, and recently I mean now one year ago, there is a wonderful, very profound, detailed analysis by Marco Ruanti, um, not, not very well known outside a very small circle, that will change, who wrote the book, The Conservative Human Rights Revolution, this is PhD, I believe it's Oxford. No, it's in the United States, so um, Yale. Um, what does he say? First of all, he situates, he analyzes in very detail the antecedents of human rights thinking in Europe. It goes back to the 19th century, but the main emphasis is, is the European Convention. Well, he says, first of all, you have to situate the European narrative of human rights in a civilizational discourse. What does that mean? part of the idea of Western European civilization. Human rights belong to Europe as part of its civilization, but it also means it does not apply to people who do not share the civilization. That's the implication of it. This thinking is very prominent, as I indicated a little bit yesterday, in the whole interwar period, and what Durant shows is that it is essential 
also in the early, in the late 40s, early 50s. That civilization is great. And take this quote of Etienne Lutzow, we have our own conception of modern society and so forth, our own civilization, which is explicitly formulated in, as a critique of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That kind of idea of universality of human rights, as we feel in the Universal Declaration, that's not our culture. People are not equal. People have not the same rights. No. It's really explicitly, you find the text here, that is what Lukács really shows. Our European civilization is not that. Is not the universality of all. Really, really amazing. It shows how conservatives in the United Kingdom, uh, Winston Churchill, for example, but also in France, in Italy, the rest of Europe, you know, it's conservative and reactionary forces who had uh, the strongest impact in the drafting of the European Convention of Human Rights. More argued that Christian forces were important, but he referred to the so-called progressive Christians. Personalism, Maritain interpreted, and I think that is wrong, in a progressive way. Durante shows, no, 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 no. Personalism is very ambiguous, but is far more connected with the extreme right. And that is what he shows very nicely and very convincingly in this book. What is central, and there it joins, more in the whole book is kind of viral with more by the way. Um, it is the fear of the totalitarian state. Human rights in the European Convention are protections for individuals against totalitarian state. And then you always think, Cold War context, you refer to the communists. Right? Correct. What Durante argues, and what he can clearly show from the documents, is that it is not just communists, but it's also social democrats. It is the fear of social democrats, sometimes even progressive Christian Democrats who get too much influence in the state. And it is protection against this totalitarianism, not just the communist law, but also the social democrat. That is what is behind. And also explains why social democrats are not very enthusiastic for the, universe, for the European Convention of Human Rights. Actually, and that's the most controversial, I think, but it has, it has clear arguments. Um, it's even imagined as a way to protect collaborators of people engaged in Vichy and so forth. This is, I must say, when I first, you, we published a number of articles on it, and first, well, that is really over the limit. But he makes his case, and it shows again what I emphasized yesterday too, how closely connected different milieus were, and how there are no clear division lines between liberals, conservatives, reactionaries, and so forth. Also not in the creation of the European institution. Not even, not even in the creation of the European Convention of Human Rights. Because indeed he plays a role. He builds this case mainly on the French case, which is the most probably the most, most clear one. But I just heard there was an interesting paper about uh, about Italian case, which shows exactly the same. So this seems also true. To right, human rights in this definition, in this interpretation remained prominent in the discourse in Europe in the 1950s. Very interesting document, the study committee for the European Constitution, 1952. Yes, 
already 1952, people thought about the European Constitution. There was within the Council of Europe a committee uh, that drafted the uh, draft constitution. And there is a far a very extensive uh, powers that are imagined with the right of intervention and clear human rights foreign policy as part of this uh, idea. In the draft for European political community of 1953, you see slowly things change. These things change. Um, while here in the study committee the emphasis is clearly on the protection for the individual against a totalitarian state, slowly this starts to change. There is less fear of a totalitarian state, I think in part because in uh, Europe you have conservative governments, so it's not the fear of a socialist or communist takeover uh, disappears. Uh, there is more fear of too powerful international institutions. That's the fear that is emerging. But so very soon the DPC collapses and very soon uh, European, uh, the whole idea of European social rights the idea of social rights disappeared from the political agenda. Reasons are the ones I mentioned, but also the colonial dimension. Because it becomes increasing, increasingly clear that you cannot develop a discourse on human rights and at the same time continue to colonize, continue to legitimize all kinds of human rights abuses in Algeria, for example, or in the Congo, or wherever. So that's certainly also a reason why, uh, this, why human rights disappear from the political agenda. And the focus is on developing social and economic uh, integration, um, the European call it steel community, the common market, Europe. No talk about human rights there. Social rights do appear. The Council of Europe issues the Social Charter in 1968, uh, 61, sorry, with, with, without much competence, and the Council of Europe is much too big as an organization to, to do something like In the 1960s, it will be quicker in the 1960s and 70s, um, human rights become prominent again, but in a slightly different shape, referring more to universal ideas. Like, I'm going to discuss this a little bit earlier, it is in part the European Court of Justice that takes a leading role. <coughs> that may be surprising. Why a court? You could say the European Court of Human Rights. That's logic. Doesn't discuss any, almost any case in the 1950s and 60s, but suddenly in the end of 60s and 70s it becomes important. But also the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice, it, you know what, what's, the, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. No. no. First, the European Union, this is a uh, 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 second part for the Council of the uh, Europe. Yes, the European Court of Human Rights is the court established as a consequence of the European Convention of Human Rights in the framework of the Council of Europe to um, rule over cases of human rights abuses, referring to the European Convention on the Declaration of Human Rights. Right? The European Court of Justice is the institution within the European communities to verify the applicability or the application of European community law. Until the 1960s, 
269, the European Court of Justice ruled that human rights were not part of community law. So it was incompetent. The European Court of Justice said, if you have complained about human rights abuse, justified or not, it's not a matter of the competence of the community. In 1969, the European Court of Justice decided that actually it is. Because the European communities follow the principles of human rights. That is actually this whole discussion is that can that be? But yes. That is what happened. The European Court of Justice has interpreted community law more broader and broader, it becomes a main actor actually in defining what is part of the European community law and legislation. legislation. It is hugely disputed, you can imagine. Quite a lot of lawyers, constitutional lawyers, actually, the, that was absolutely not justified. Later, we see that um, the European Union has accepted this and said, well, this is what's correct. And by doing so, legitimized this actually outstepping, well, I think you cannot interpret it in any other way as outstepping the competence of the court. But that is what happened. So that was an important element. Both courts started to be very important for defense of human rights. A kind of competition developed between the two, very, very interesting. In the 1960s, you see um, those pressure groups, the United States changes, Helsinki process, and within Europe also the search for new identity, political identity after the colonization. And then human rights become a key element. <coughs> um, an evolution that I discussed yesterday a little bit. And after the fall of the Iron Curtain, this was reinforced and then you see that there's very strong emphasis on uh, human rights uh, today, with particularly the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union in 2000. A few comments. Uh, I'm almost there. Take a bit more time than I expected. First, if you compare, if you look at evolution within Europe, first of all, very interesting. Initially, human rights were the competence of the Council of Europe. They moved to the European communities, the European Union today, uh, and that leaves some, some, some tension until today. But actually, it's really the, the, the European Union that is uh, the leading role, takes the lead role today. What is perhaps the most surprising is that the EU today, with regard to human rights, it adopts on the one hand the idea of universality. It's part of its external action. It has really adopted the broader the slides doesn't come to the fore too much in the article also, but he accepted the universalist discourse, but it's far less interventionist. It's far less, uh, as far less competence as it was imagined in the early 1950s. And in particular with the draft for the European Constitution of 1952. If you compare those two documents, very interesting if you look at that. And what is now today the instruments that the European Union has, the European Union, nor the European Court of Justice, and don't have really instruments to implement any policy. Well, that was the purpose of the draft constitution of 1952, to have these instruments. 
um, to make this very concrete, if the European Union had the competences that were imagined in 1952, you will have a very different situation in Hungary today, or in Poland, without any doubt. Because both in Poland and in Hungary there are very big questions about the uh, um, maintenance of the rule of law, and then you would have an instrument, you would have uh, a court, you would have the European Court of Justice, would have been competent and had the power to intervene. Now, the European Union has no power whatsoever. What, what happened? So that is the, the significance of this. Right. Challenges today, well, I refer already to the erosion of the rule of law in some countries in Eastern Europe, but also elsewhere. It's not typical for, for this part of the world. You see that in my own country, you see very similar developments. And the issue of freedom of religion uh, that raises a lot of, of questions. Very briefly, a number of conclusions. First of all, if you think about the history of human rights as a single line of, pro of progress, that you should forget. Reality is far more complex, and it's not linear, and it is not always a simple line of progress even. It is far, far more complex than that. Uh, Moyen has really uh, changed the debate. And you cannot speak about human rights without referring somehow to more. But he also has very strongly limited the debate. So I think we have to move away from more. <laughs> oh, I think it was important. This book was extremely important. But I have really, really big, big problems. You really have to resituate the issue of human rights within broader developments so humanitarianism. And I think actually Lynn Hunt's book, that was so attacked and by, by Moyen, actually in many, in many ways, the approach of, of Linton is more interesting, I think, than the one of Moyen in the end. Um, right. The whole discussion of human rights that we have, it sometimes it seems it's like well, the continuation of the Cold War. Especially in, if you look at more and always emphasizing the individuality of human rights uh, without taking into account the idea of self-determination. Now, very bizarre. So I think that is uh, uh, a key element we have to re... We have to um, broaden the perspective again. Uh, okay. I leave it to that. Uh, I suppose there will be some questions. Oh, why don't you show this list what we did this one? In fact, just... <laughs> <coughs> um, the reason why it's a bit lost here, but actually it should, I should have been mentioned it earlier, because it illustrates how the European Union has broadened its interpretation of human rights and really included the universalist. But this is a good, what's the problem with this? There's no problem. It's, it's a good development. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, um, it ties into the discussion, the presentation of yesterday, to which extent the European Union has realized a break with its past. But if you refer to the break with its past, it's also the break of the, the 1950s, in which also human rights were the problem is that in a Cold War. There are, there are no guarantees. No yeah. guarantees that these uh, rights are secured. So a country cannot apply. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like a as a Hungarian, I cannot go to the European Court of Justice and the uh, question that what's happening here and the poor cannot do the same. So it's just like uh, 
like a prey. Exactly. That's the point. Very nice to see such uh, such sentences. But uh, we were educated in communism, and uh, yeah. during communism we had such uh, very uh, <laughs> sounding uh, sentences by we have been seated in prisons. Yeah. I, I fully but, but what do you see how, how this contradiction can be resolved? Because it's nice that you give a presentation for us, uh, a specialness about uh, the benefits of freedom, but uh, what kind of advice you can give us? Mm. Yes, what kind of advice I can give? To emigrate. <coughs> yeah. Or to be born. Or to die. the best way to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid that as a historian I cannot say very much. I, yeah, Attila, until I want to intervene because you, so I think you will react even as an answer. So if you go back to history, so you refer to a great number of documents, a great number of statements, a great number of political resolutions. Uh, do you have examples for enforcement? So this is very much connected to Julie's question, so, but in a historical sense. Uh, yes. I think that it would be very interesting to structure a book uh, along the line of uh, this uh, ups and downs development of dealing with human rights, and at the same time trying to search for implementations, enforcement, because in the very long run, if you have this 1,000 year approach that you also have in your book, uh, I think we can show some progress also in the implementation and, and the development. It's not so easy. It's easier to quote uh, the document and uh, refer to, a, to progress. Uh, but uh, but it was another question, so, which uh, has a very practical implication. The right, the human right of the dead. Because basically these uh, rights refer to the people who are alive. But uh, the problem is that uh, it, it's very practical because a couple of years ago the Hungarian parliament passed a law that uh, streets and public, spa public uh, spaces cannot be named after people and institutions that are connected to authoritarian rule. Of course, it's very complicated what is an authoritarian rule, etc., etc. But uh, uh, when you are, as an historian, you are dealing with the evaluation of, of certain people, they, there, there, are, there should be, in the, in the, I think it was in 15 years ago at the Amsterdam Congress of World Historians, there was a special session about the rights of the dead. So, whether if uh, you write something in a historical statement about my grand-grandfather that is against his honor and hurts his basic human rights, can it be uh, an issue for any law court? Or can it at all be argued that it's against certain uh, basic human rights? And that is... <laughs> and, uh, the, the other is the right of animals. Uh, that is also when we are looking at this environmental problem, so basic animal rights. And uh, for different types of animals, of course, a parrot may have a different approach than an elephant. So it's, but, but still, so it's, uh, that, is, that is also an issue, because people are frequently punished for maltreatment of animals, but the legal basis of this is, I think, not so absolutely clear. So just, just a few of the main trend yeah. remarks. And the rights of future generations. The rights of future generations. That is also yeah, the rights of, uh, of future generations. So, that, so, so sorry, and this is, I think this is very important because this is a, a crossroad, so to say, of uh, or, or uh, uh, conflictful encounters of individual and human rights. Because this is the, the big, big end of debate was about abortion. So that, uh, so it's, of course, it's 
an unalien inalienable human right of women, I think, I fully agree that they should decide. At the same time, there is a kind of a collective responsibility for the, for the future generations. I don't think this can be resolved, but we have to be aware of this. Right. I don't have really answers. Um, certainly not on, on, on the question what needs needs to be done. I will first go into that because I don't want to run away from the question. <laughs> As a historian, you look at the past and not so much at the future, but you look at the question of Attila is um, are there examples of implementation actually? Can we learn from that? There are very few. I think there are two major, perhaps three major venues. The simplest one. And, but it's already extremely difficult, is to some extent you have to depoliticize problems. And the, the only way to depoliticize de is to, to criminalize them or to judicialize them. Um, right, yesterday evening we still had a, a, a whole discussion about what kind of institutions do you need. I think particularly you need a variety of different kinds of institutions. But I do think um, to solve a number of problems within, within, within Europe, a judicial approach is a valid approach. And that means strengthening the European Court of Justice, while at the same time you also need to, to limit it. Because I, I also think that the, the development in the late 60s and early 70s, in which the European Court of Justice was an actor within the process of unification, that's not the task of a court, in my view. But it is a way to depolitize issues. So in that sense, I am, in a way, very much in favor of strengthening, but at the same time, limiting the competences of the European Court of Justice, which, which would imply a revolution, because it really would imply that an important part of sovereignty of national states will be, must be transferred to supranational institutions. It's the only way. It's really the only way. The other the other venue is progress has been and problems have been solved by treaties. By treaties. So you really have to negotiate on fundamental issues. And I have the impression that somehow people forget that it's part of the essential diplomatic practices. But you have to renegotiate treaties. Negotiate treaties and renegotiate. But negotiate you have to do. Because just sitting there will not solve anything. I negotiate means sitting on the table. A third kind of value is I don't, uh, somehow I think within the European tradition we are limited in our ways of conflict resolutions. And I do think you have in some other places traditions that may help. I always very strange to refer very, very ages, to refer ages back, but the, the way um, conflicts were solved and discussed in the time of the Indian King Ashok, for example, refers to a very different way of conflict resolution that may help to inspire. That, just like our thinking about freedom of religion, for example, during the, what we call the Enlightenment, has been inspired not only by internal European traditions, but also has been inspired by 
non-European traditions. Uh, African traditions for one hand, and I, one thing I have studied a little bit is American Indian traditions. The whole way how uh, the American in the United States uh, a system of uh, church-state separation was created is not just an application of European traditions of religious toleration. It is also the introduction of American Indian pragmatism, which is very, very little known. This whole research is really only a few people who are working on it. But this, this, this confrontation of ideas, of non European and European ideas in, in North America, I said it a little bit for the 17th century, um, was decisive in creating a new type of society, of political organization with full freedom of religion, complete separation of church and state, actually the, what becomes the First Amendment in the American Constitution is to a large extent inspired by experiences in, in what now is Rhode Island. And it is there that this kind of reality, that's, that's kind of where this kind of experiment took place. And it solved the problems at that time. I wonder if we do not need a similar kind of totally, it sounds, I know, absolutely utopian, but I think we do need to look outside our own frameworks. Because I do think that the toolbox that we have is not sufficient. But I'm just a simple historian, to be honest. <laughs> it's very interesting. Just to thank you for your great lecture. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. But just two small questions. One, just recalling a very important book, Do We Have Human Rights, written by Janusz Kisz, who was in the late 70s, early 80s, the central figure of the Hungarian dissident movement, an excellent philosopher. Right now, he's the head of the political department at Central University. And I remember that for the Hungarian dissident movement and beyond, that was a basic kind of manual how we should develop our dissent toward a situation that seemed to be unchangeable yeah. in the early 80s. We didn't dream about having the world down and having that freedom mm -hmm. and whatever we were hoping for. So I think just wanted to recall because that, I don't know if you know this book. I'm not no, sure. I have heard of the name of the author, but I didn't read the book or whatever. So I was very interesting at the NYU for several years and he's in international law and legal and yeah, human rights yeah, issues yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, so I think that I, I mean, it may not have been even translated but it was a very important <laughs> reading for us. Yeah, so if you have to look at Hungary yeah. for that. And the other, what I wanted to refer to, the, whether the rule of law yeah. uh, would not contradict every now and then to basic human rights, like the Nuremberg laws or the Stalinist laws, I mean people could be just dislocated from their property, or we are parliament recently elected will pass the so-called Soros bill, which will restrict the civil uh, NGOs. And so if I respect this law, how can I respect human rights that otherwise is? Or should I have to apply to the Constitutional Court of Strasbourg? So what would be your comment about that? I uh, like that question. I feel very, very much away from my comfort zone. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. But, um, I think you're absolutely right, of course. Um, I certainly inclined am in favor of a view of universality of human rights and also of primord primordiality of, of, of human rights, formulated at a very basic level, though, because otherwise you're creating all kinds of problems. Um, everything is in, in what you call the rule. And, and how radical you interpret it, because there's also quite some discussion about the definition of what is rule, the rule of law and what are the boundaries, what falls in it, and what. It, I don't think the rule of law implies or should imply, because for a lot of scholars it does, 
following every law that has been issued. Um, as I mentioned also in a previous occasion, there are always moments where you have to break the law. There are always moments where you, where you not have to follow the law. And of course, this can be only in, in extreme cases. Uh, but when they conflict with uh, human rights, I would say that would be one moment. But of course, who is the judge of what, what, what kind of human when you are speaking about human law? And then the individual will come conscious. I think in extreme cases it's absolutely, I would say, legitimate not to follow the rule of law. There always, and I think in, in the cases of, of totalitarianism, authoritarianism, that's legitimate. But that's a very moral attitude in the end. But that would be my, my, my position, but I think it's a theoretical so, position. May, may I refer what you might call the, the other side of the coin? So this is very much connected, I think, to Andras' questions concerning uh, laws that you shouldn't respect if they are against human rights. What about the history of human duties and obligations? Yeah. And how they refer to the right? Because, uh, and so to say, to put it very bluntly, so at the beginning of human civilization, duties and obligations are considered to be more important than uh, rights. So if you look at the Ten Commandments, so they do not refer to the ten basic rights of, of people, but ten commandments. Uh, and uh, there is a anti-liberal argumentation, a funny one that I hear, that if it had been up to liberals, they wouldn't be the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Recommendations. <laughs> so, that, uh, and, uh, this, so this is this is this is a very 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 complex issue. This is a very very complex issue. So in order to make sure that your rights are respected, what are your duties? What is and if you don't respect your duties, can you truly expect from the state, from the society, from whatever that your rights will be respected? Again, and this is far from being a very abstract issue. Yeah. Uh, when I pass by office buildings wherever in the world, what do a lot of people do all around the buildings? They drink coffee and smoke. Uh, now, uh, and that's, it's, it's absolutely right, and no, no problem about this. But uh, when there were some attempts at uh, adjusting somehow health care to the habits, of people, so imposing certain obligations on people to take care of their own health in order to get the right of health care, then there was tremendous opposition. There was, uh, now I forget this gentleman who uh, had a pharmaceutical company, Bereshek has, or you know, Shomodi. 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 And he developed a special healthcare system of his own company where the obligation was that every I don't know, year or so people had to go through certain checks, health checks, because prevention seems to be much cheaper than curing. And he had to give it up. He had to give it up. Because although it would have been in the interest of the people, somehow they, they didn't respect it. What, as of, what do you do if uh, a doctor prescribes you an expensive medicine, you get it at a relative, no, no, but you used to get it at a relatively reasonable price, and you don't take it. And then you go, you go back again because negligence, etc. So, that you can, so I think this is just not abstract philosophical issues, but parts of our everyday life. So this is... Uh, I don't know if anyone has you definitely the history of human obligations or duty. It's interesting that you mention that because um, I think it's very clear that the, the 
idea of obligation has been almost forgotten. It's coming back. Um, but it's interesting that in the book of Durante, and in this discussion of, 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 cons of the conservative view of human rights, actually this idea of obligation is very important. Uh, we are thinking of formulating a research project following up the idea of human rights uh, on human it's kind of obvious, more civic obligations because it's, so, it's more complex than that. Um, because that history is completely forgotten. And it's strange because I also know that Sam Moyne is thinking along the same lines. And he's also setting up something around uh, civic obligations. And it's also interesting to, to note he has a new book, book that I'm not sure if it is already published or not with Harvard University Press, uh, in which he, in, to a large extent, comes back from its original position of emphasizing individual human rights, emphasizing, emphasizing uh, social rights. And if, because if you start to speak about social rights, almost automatically you also refer to duties, because in, social rights are much more, in a way, more complex. And they, they, because they engage the collectivity, they engage the state. It's one of the reasons why why both were dissociated, and for example, uh, in the background of the discussion of the European Convention of Human Rights, initially social, economic, cultural rights and uh, individual human rights were united, but they were dissociated because the issue of the social, cultural rights was much too complicated, and so we decided to proceed first with the pol more political individual rights, and that, well, that was then the European Convention of Human Rights. But for the social rights, you had to wait until 1961. Uh, but it is the same group of people, it came from the same origin, actually. But there, the, you know, the element of, of responsibility for the collectivity, and then you speak about the is far more important. In the beginning of your presentation, you made a reference that maybe uh, not just Western uh, background can be identified when we think about human rights. And can you give some sources that out of Western influences in the formation of human rights, like from well, yeah. the perspective or yes, Chinese or, or whatever? Yeah, um, there are two. two two different parts of the answer. One part is that uh, you have conceptions of, of human rights in many civilizations. And the second is, uh, can you show direct influences? I start with the last, the last issue. While you can see in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, the different orders were not all the Europeans, there were quite a number of people of non-European origin, partly with the strong European or Western education, but you do see, you can see that a lot of research on it showing that non-European ideas had an influence. Looking at the broader picture, you have lots of documents uh, of, of, of human rights, but I think look at I will refer to the field I am most familiar with, and that's the field of uh, religious freedom, the freedom of religion. Because that I am I, 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 far, by far the yeah, best. Um, in the European tradition, freedom of religion has a complex history. Um, it is in part an answer by First humanist and enlightened thinkers against um, confessional models implying uh, the following one religion, implying that you have to follow one religion. Um, the idea of freedom of religion. 
how it is formulated in public glass view. The key thing is really unlock really key persons here. Follow on one hand a tradition that runs deep into Luther, the young Luther particularly, from Luther to the Anabaptists and then to people like like what particular. That's one line. Um, the, the line I was referring to, in the American case, for example, is an interesting figure, Roger Williams, who comes from that tradition, is a separatist Puritan, who goes to North America, to Massachusetts, is a real Puritan, follows uh, the Puritan model, and the Puritan model meaning you have one particular interpretation of Calvinism, and that's the real one. The problem with Puritans is you have as many different views of what is true Puritanism as you have Puritans. Williams was one of the most radical who said you have to follow your belief, whatever the, the local authorities, the king in Britain, but also in Massachusetts, the local authority said, the moment external authorities, secular authorities, or religious authorities, whatever, say what you have to believe, you run into problems of conscience. So Roger Williams cannot live in, um, in Massachusetts either. He has to flee and then enters into uh, an American Indian community. As an interesting figure, he learned uh, the native language. Now what he finds there is that the freedom of religion and a number of other liberties are automatically granted. And he finds it very strange. He can, he can uh, follow his, his beliefs and he understands from that Indian example that these American Indians have a different concept of identity, but particularly a different interpretation of how people with extreme divergent views have to live together. And they say, well, the, better, the best way, especially if the other is threatening, is to somehow embrace them. You embrace the difference. It's, also, it's a different way of conceiving human rights. And it is that experience, the idea of embracing difference, that William takes home and he establishes his own colony, the one that will become Rhode Island, where he practices this idea, absolute liberty of religion, a, a kind of republican democratic state, is the only place where Quakers are welcome, for example. From the very beginning, Quakers in the 17th century, speaking of the uh, 1640s, are the most provocative, uh, disrupting religious sect at that moment. And they're chased out of Europe, they're chased out of every a colony in, in North America as well, with one major exception, that's Rhode Island. And it's because of this, and, and you see the struggle of, of, of Williams there, using his ideas about religious freedom as a moral Christian duty, because he radicalizes his ideas that he had before, pre or young Lutheran ideas of religious freedom as a divine imperative, but in combination with this, uh, and very explicit, in combination with this American pragmatic idea. And here we see all the things coming together. You have a different concept of, of rights within that American Indian community. 
you have also, you see also how the European and the non-European tradition come together. It's very interesting because Williams, if you need see it in an outpost in North America, he is in conversation with uh, quite a, a lot of enlightened uh, thinkers at that moment in Europe who reflect on his thing for, for their thinking, what, what is developed in Europe as far too many. There's no one who accepts these radical ideas of, of Williams in, in America. In, in Europe, nobody follows that. It's far too radical. But you also see how they, they, they take their distance, but in a, in a form of dialogue. And that is what I mean. They have a constant interaction. Um, because the 17th century is this early Enlightenment period is very interesting because yeah, you see similar things between uh, African uh, theologians. At that moment, you still have that, that an intellectual dialogue. That intellectual dialogue stops around 1800. But until then, you still have it. Uh, if you think about this problem of animal rights and so forth, um, you can refer to, to Ashok, uh, who has a whole concept of human rights, Dhamma, which is conceived as rights and obligations, but that go much further than in the Western tradition. Because not only because of the association between rights and duties, but the protection. And also there, in a different way, the idea of embracement of difference uh, is extends not only to humans, but also to animals. So animal rights you will find uh, defined and protected within the Indian tradition. Desperately looking at the right date of Ashok. I'm not so sure anymore, so I don't. But he's, he's, well, he's the main Buddhist king of India. And it becomes a real political philosophy based on the rights, duties, and the respect of difference. That makes it so fascinating. It's because it's this kind of accepting and embracing differences is something that is entirely lacking in the European tradition. You don't have it. Which, and you have it, I come to you, both in, 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 in some North American context and Indian context. But beware, I don't say you have that everywhere. The Chinese have a very different way of conceiving difference. So don't misunderstand me. I don't make another East-West distinction. Uh, okay, uh, it appears to me that on the basis of your talk that the evolution of human rights, at least partially, is a fear-driven uh, process. We fear of something, so we develop new human rights. Like we fear of uh, you know, powerful uh, nation-states and uh, Consequently, it appears in the formulation of human rights, it becomes more personalized or universal or whatever. Okay, but time goes by and new powers appear uh, in the world. So today, uh, human rights, it's a subjective opinion. Human rights uh, appear to me as the religion of the new globalized uh, world order. Uh, and as every religion, it, it has its church, it has its priests working in the institutions of science and media. It's fine. Okay, but, um, but the problem is that when it becomes a religion, uh, it, 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 be it also becomes a dogma. And if, when it, when, if it's dogma, uh, it changes, uh, the evolution starts, you know? And I think the the human right movement should continue. The evolution should continue. Uh, 
I don't care if it's a, a fear-driven process. I think it's good because there are new fears. I have new fears. Uh, people have new fears. For example, uh, the new powers. Who are the new powers? You know, multinational companies. Just follow the money. Everybody knows who are talk I am talking about. Uh, so I think we need a new human rights 2.0 uh, something. We, we, we need further development of human rights. What is your opinion about it? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, I think my whole talk was a bit about how human rights have been redefined, reimagined at several points of time. And in some ways you could say every time has every period has its own human rights or the ways human rights are formulated and I identified and interpreted in a way. Um, this being said, I still do think that um, human rights interpreted are something that are, are, are universal, but in that we need to advance further in exploring human rights and advancing human rights, I would uh, very strongly uh, support. Is there a kind of church of human rights that I don't think so? Um, but it, sometimes, and that is partly also one way, the point of, of, of people like mine and others and where I follow, follow the critique particularly is that human rights are defined as a utopia, but the utopia becomes a new ideology. Um, and then you, you, you need to, to move beyond that in, in, in many ways. The way uh, Moyn defines human rights are the human rights as seen by the liberal capitalist Cold War American elite. And that's why it has no attention for self determination, no attention for social rights, and so forth. In some ways, now he is frightened by, by what he has created in a way. And he returns to the more inclusive and, and broader definition of, of human rights, which I also think we really need to do. Um, if if human rights are always defined as out of fear, that, that goes a little bit too far, I think, but yes, it certainly do in reaction to a number of uh, constraints. And you could say that today the constraints are partly different, and then you refer to Multinational companies. Oh yeah, I think there I will follow you. I will follow you that there certainly need, but that's again that is in fact something else. We need constraints on, on, on the role of multinational companies, for example, that is splitting for kind of uh, global governance system actually, because that's the only way to constrain a company. Um, I don't think that's, a, that's really a, a, an answer to your question. Partially. Partially. <laughs> that's, that's an idea. Could I? Yeah, sure. The uh, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights became a binding legal act in the European Union since 2009. Yeah. But uh, however, the uh, European Convention of Human Rights still exists. And uh, you don't think this be, uh, make European law, European legal system more complicated? Because if, for my personal opinion, this is what's like uh, update of uh, European Convention of Human Rights, uh, this uh, 
uh, uh, in, uh, and what kind of meanings uh, the existence of this European Convention of Human Rights, which was uh, established in 1950 and ratified by the state, and uh, it's ratified and exists in Council of Europe. Why it makes so complicated? And you don't think this is uh, something which make uh, more bureaucratic? That's a good question. I'm afraid it always works like that. Um, but you, you certainly have a point in, in saying, well, perhaps the whole legal system is outdated. I think that, that, that comes for almost every legal system. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I, I come from, from Belgium where you know that the legal system is always built up new layers and layers mm -hmm. and, and in the end nobody knows what, what's there anymore. Uh, this being said, there are important differences between the European Convention and what is now the Human Rights Acquis. Uh, in the EU, first of all, the, that restrictive interpretation has been totally changed. You have now the universal uh, interpretation. Uh, that's a major issue. The second major element is that social rights are now, uh, that social charter is also constituent part of the uh, legal framework of uh, the European Union. Uh, what needs to be done, you, yes, you could make things more, more clear, more simple, but I think the main thing is first, yes, you should extend the human rights, in particular in the fields of social and economic rights, and that would be an answer to, to to the question of the gentleman there, um, because by reinforcing the social rights of individuals, but also you also uh, introduce, you have to introduce measure to bind the, the, the influence of, of companies in support of the, the space of uh, the multinational companies and so forth. Uh, very important also on the level of the environment. Uh, and they are, you can use human rights, and it has been used in a number of cases, uh, to compel governments mm -hmm. to defend, to, to implement uh, environmental measures. In a number of countries that has been used, I think there is still a lot of things to do. So that's you certainly, there is a lot of room to extend and develop uh, human rights in a more broader sense at the EU level. But at the same time, for me, it's also absolutely necessary to strengthen the judicial uh, apparatus. And I'm going to turn to the previous issue. As long as it is just legislation, perhaps also because I come from Belgium, where you have a lot of laws but nobody follows them. Um, you need an apparatus, a judicial apparatus, and, and a kind of police apparatus to implement them. And here the EU has no competences at all. Well, not, at, not at all, it's too much. You have the European Court of Justice. But its instruments are, for me, far too weak. So that's certainly also something to develop. However, how do you can reconcile this with the demand of people that the claim of people that there is already too much Europe, you have to return to nation states and so forth. That's in one way irreconcilable. I do think you have to make the case. And I think people will understand well, two things. One is that the only way to solve problems, a number of problems, not all the problems, but a lot major problems, you have to do that at the higher level. The level of the nation state is not strong enough for the major uh, challenges, for the environment, migration, uh, the problems of emerging authoritarianism and so forth. I'm afraid you cannot really solve these problems at the level of the nation state. You have to have stronger uh, 
real supranational instruments. Well, like I said, but at the same time, um, I forgot what I want to You continue with me. Uh, I wanted to say something else. Maybe European Union needs constitutions, not so many articles, uh, treaties, and uh, this will arrange more. And yeah, I, I don't believe too much in constitutions, but it, it may help. The main problem is that the EU lacks legitimacy. But it is also an illusion to think legitimacy will increase at national level. Because the, the nation states all suffer from the same lack of legitimacy and, and power. And it works, some, some governments can work well for a certain time, but not for in the longer term. And I think that people have to realize that implies you need a much, you have stronger supranational institutions, but you have at the same time, you have you need to go down for other problems to, to implement to much lower levels. The, the, the level of the nation state, I'm afraid, is not, is not the most adequate level anymore. Sometimes the level of the city, of the community, is far more important. And you have legitimacy, political legitimacy, for all kinds of measures at the local level. I think that the, the national level at the moment there, there is from many people have focus on this national level, but I think it's the least adequate to solve problems at this moment. You need either more local or more supranational. But you you need to reinforce those two levels. And that in-between level, but of course the national level. It's a very different issue if you speak about Luxembourg or you speak about Poland or, or Germany. I mean, th this issue of scale, the Luxembourg is a village. But, but I don't think you can solve problems at the level of Germany or, or Hungary or, or Poland or whatever. A smaller state like Luxembourg, perhaps. But you need both. Is that an answer to your question? Mm -hmm. it's, it's so complicated European mm -hmm. legal system for me. I try to overcome with that still. Yeah. It's yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Thank you.